want to give a shout out with the floor that was just installed. It was done by Adam Roth, one of our church members, and just really stepped up, took care of it. Can we give it up for Adam? And that floor is actually connected. It'll be the same floor in the bathrooms, the bathroom project that we talked about last year. Now it's starting up. And as Adam stepped up, I was thinking about in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, different people that had different talents and gifts would go to work in God's building, God's temple, God's house. And I just want to continue to invite anyone who wants to get involved. If you've got some skills, you're kind of handy in painting or different things, just write on your connecting card projects and we'll get you on the team. And, and it's a great way to serve the Lord too. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, thank you for your grace, God. Thank you for our church family. Thank you how personal you are. And God, we pray specifically for people today, right here, who are carrying a lot of stress, a lot of discouragement, a lot of fear, a lot of worry, maybe even bitterness and resentment. God, that you would take it away in Jesus' name, and you would bring your joy and your peace that comes from only your presence, your healing presence. We look to you to do that now, God, that we would be free to worship you and free to listen and free to serve you. Free us, we pray, Jesus, in your name, amen. This series is called The Hand of God, and we are walking through the book of Esther. When it comes to the hand of God, we want to recognize, appreciate, and trust God's hand. We see a range of reactions in the first couple chapters. In chapter 1, King Xerxes, and this takes place in Persia, King Xerxes rejects God's hand, and he's full of arrogance, makes some really bad decisions, disrespect, selfishness, and it leads to a divorce. The king and the queen are no longer together. There's a tragedy in chapter 1. But then in chapter 2, Mordecai and Esther say yes to God's hand. And we see this in terms of healing. As Esther is Mordecai's cousin, her parents died while she was young, but Mordecai adopted her, and now she has a new family. Also, she has an incredible opportunity that God opens up for her, and she becomes queen. In addition to that, we see protection as Mordecai foils a plan to assassinate the king. They say yes to God's hand. It's very evident. But then chapter 3, the decree. Haman, directly opposing God, opposing God's hand, sets out and really he persuades the king for a decree, an edict across the land that would be the annihilation of all of the Jews. Hatred, destruction in chapter 3. So now we enter into chapter 4. And for the Israelites, their backs are against the wall. Can you relate to that at all? Can you think of different times in your life when your back's really been against the wall, the odds are against you, challenges are significant, they feel overwhelming, you don't know how you're going to get through this particular trial, what do you do when your back's against the wall? This is Esther chapter 4. We're going to see how Esther and Mordecai are going to respond. Here's the main idea from this chapter. Pay attention to and embrace God's initial and powerful work underneath the surface. Let's say this main idea out loud together. Pay attention to and embrace God's initial and powerful work underneath the surface. In chapter 4, there's four specific ways we see God's hand, and it's a progression. Here's the first one. God stirs you in the deepest ways. God stirs you in the deepest ways. God's first work is often going to be to move your heart and to move your soul and to move you in deep places. Now we see it. Take a look at chapter 3, verse 1. After these events, King Xerxes, when Mordecai learned, that was just a little uh, flashback to chapter 3, now chapter 4, when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Loud wailing from Mordecai. Have you ever done that? Just started wailing and mourning out loud? He also has sackcloth and ashes. He uh, tears his clothes. He is entering in with God into the grieving. Do you do those two things? Emotionally enter in with God. 
A lot of people don't enter in to the pain in their lives. And they try to numb the pain. They run to sin. They're in denial of the pain. They just try to stuff the pain. Mordecai enters in. It's really healthy. But here's the key. Enter in with God. Some people enter into the pain and they do it alone. We're not designed to go through it alone. We enter into the pain with God like Mordecai is doing here. Perhaps he felt some responsibility. Going back to chapter 3, verse 4. He refused to bow down to Haman, who is second in the land. And in addition, he also revealed that he's Jewish. Maybe he's having second thoughts. If I wouldn't have revealed that, maybe then there wouldn't be this threat against all my people. He's taking all of this in and deep calls out to deep. Deep pain leads to deep prayers. Deep desires, deep prayers. Deep hope, deep prayers. Deep need, deep prayers. It's good to go deep with the Lord in prayer. That's what we see here, prayer and fasting. We were fasting together as a church in January. I encourage you to continue to fast throughout this year. Find different points, weeks, days, meals, where you fast and you seek the Lord. It's a pattern throughout Scripture. Yes, it's humbling. It's kind of raw. You give up something that's good, and you can give up something small, but you gain something much bigger. When you fast and you pray, you're sincerely saying, God, I desire you. God, you have my attention, my focus. I'm saying no to some of the status quo in my life. I want your hand. I want you to move, God. And when you fast, there's kind of a ricochet effect spiritually. It's kind of a holy ricochet as things start to move. It's like tectonic plates start to shift, if you like that word picture. Or dominoes, if you prefer that. You know, you knock that first domino down, it starts to move. When you fast and pray, Jesus said, when you fast and pray, spiritually, things happen. Things happen. God's power moves. You might not see it all initially. You might not see the full effects of it. But when you fast and pray, there is spiritual momentum. Take that step, fast and pray, and that's what Mordecai's doing here. Uh, as you fast and pray, God stirs the heart, and we see this throughout. For the Israelites, you know, they went into exile in Babylon, and then the Persians came in and took over. Spoiler alert, God's going to deliver them in this book. They're going to return to the land, and a common thread, a golden thread and theme, is how God stirs different people's hearts. Take a look at Ezra chapter 1, verse 5. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. This historically takes place after the book of Esther, and God starts to move some of the people's hearts as they have the opportunity to return to Jerusalem. Also, there's another prophet named Haggai, and uh, in chapter 1, verse 13, we read this. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. And he stirred up the spirit of Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. What happened? God started to stir up hearts to return to the land. Stir up hearts like Nehemiah to rebuild the city and the wall. Stir up hearts like Zerubbabel to mobilize the people. Ezra as a prophet to direct their hearts back and stir up the people to build up the house of the Lord, the temple of God. Do you see how God works? His hand in our heart, deep in our soul, he starts to stir things up. There's a sequence in the Bible. God moves the person. God moves the situation. God moves Abraham, he starts with the person, and then God forms a new nation that is designed to bless the other nations. God moves in Moses, and then God will move in the situation to set the people free from slavery. God moves in David's heart, a rebel's heart. God takes over, and then David takes down Goliath. Daniel, God moved him in a difficult context spiritually. And what happened? Lions became pillows. I just like saying that. Lions became pillows. He, God moved in Mary's heart and she raised the Messiah. God moves in a person, then God moves in a situation. Let me ask you, how is God stirring you? Are you paying attention? Are you embracing what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life right now? 
How is he stirring you? And ultimately, it's not about the person. It's not about Abraham or Moses or you or your neighbor. Ultimately, this is about who God is. God cares about us deeply. He knows us. In our weakness, he's powerful. He stirs us. He gives us gifts. He involves us. The same God that's stirring people then is the same God that's stirring people in Grace Community Church today. Let him stir you. Let him move your heart. Embrace it. That's the start of this chapter. Here's the second way that God's hand moves. God's purpose radiates powerfully from you to other people. Let's take a look at verse 4. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. And then we see in verse 11, she says, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. It's like a game of operator. Remember that game growing up where one person tells the next person, tells the next person? Well, passion is going to start to spread. Awareness is going to spread. It's going to start with Mordecai and then the people around him. It's going to travel over to the maids and the eunuchs. It's going to arrive with Esther. From Esther to Hathak, and then Hathak's going to travel, Hathak's going to come back, and then report it back to Esther. As they're all trying to figure out what's happening, and what is God doing, and what does God want us to do. That name Hathak, it's easy to skip over that. If someone asked you today, on your way to church, do you know who Hathak is? I'm like, what? Hathak? Sounds like Aflac? Aflac? Hathak? Sounds like insurance or something? A duck? You know, who is this? Hathak faithful in his role behind the scenes. I want to encourage you today, if you don't have a prominent role, and a lot of people don't notice you or pat you on the back, would you just stay faithful? It's okay to serve in obscurity. It's okay to serve in, uh, if you're anonymous in the serving, it's okay because God sees your faithfulness. He will reward you and just know that's enough for this season. It's okay if no one else is showering praise on you. You're being faithful to God like Hathak is right here. And they are gaining the facts, they're realizing the pain of this edict and all the implications, and then what starts is a chain that gets activated. Gain the facts, the pain is felt, the chain is activated. Here's a very small example of that in our house. Uh, We dropped cable TV a while back, it's been good for our family, and we bought a little Roku box, $50, so we get some shows, and Comcast provides our Wi-Fi and Well, with that, shows started cutting out a couple months ago. In the middle of the show, it just cuts out. Show's over. you got to stop and rewind. One time my wife and I were sitting down for a date, and it's like, oh, the show cuts out. Oh, we got to start all over again. Find the spot. Oh, it cuts out again. Find the spot. I waited too long uh, to call Comcast. But anyways, Comcast came, and from that show's cutting out, what they discovered as they looked underneath the house is that the original install was flawed, and some of the wires and cables were not grounded. And he said, it's so good we discovered it, because if lightning hit your house, the whole house would be up in flames. The cables were never grounded. And so from that pain of shows cutting out led to a greater solution that now uh, we don't have the same fire threat if lightning hits our house. Well, you're going to notice this pattern in your life. You're going to gain some facts, and you're going to feel the pain. It's okay sometimes to feel that pain. But then what is God doing towards a solution? You know, when uh, I came to Grace School over three years ago, our debt was about $2.5 million. Praise the Lord. That debt is now under $400,000. And, and it's God stirring all of us, and we're just seeing what God's doing. That thing's going to be gone because that kind of debt, it hinders ministry. And when that's gone, there's all kinds of freedom. And so at God's hand at work, prayer. We take a look around in our own families. We take a look around in our city. We take a look around in our nation, and we see what's happening and we need to pray. And so we're praying. We started 24-7 prayer. And God stirred and you just responded. And slots are getting filled up. Half hour slots. Like, yes, we need to pray as a church. And so it's God's solution. 
and you say, you know, there's so many things God's doing. What's next? I really believe it's a discipleship movement. I believe it's life on life. I believe it's people going deep in the church. I believe it's people coming to know Jesus, new disciples. I believe it's within the walls of our church and it's beyond the walls of our church. I believe it's turning to Jesus across the sound. I believe it's healthy churches across the sound. I think God is stirring in this direction. I see more and more people saying, yes, we need this in listening to the Lord. May God write the script on that. But it's exciting to think of spiritual awakening. And maybe for you when you hear that, there's some tension. For Esther, there was some tension. Tension's good sometimes. Jesus brought tension with the followers, and they grew with that tension. Here's the tension for Esther. There's a law in the land. If you approach the king and you're not summoned, the king kills you. That's the law. Or if you approach the king and there's sadness, the king can kill you. And now I just compare that law to Jesus. Jesus, the king of kings, has a throne of grace where he welcomes us to come as we are before him. Can you bring sadness into the presence of the king? Jesus says, yes, bring the sadness. In fact, you can bring it. He'll enter in with you. Jesus wept at the funeral, and then Jesus will carry it. He will carry our burdens. What a savior. What a king. And you compare that to the law of the land. Well, there was one hope for Esther, and that's the golden scepter would be extended. If that golden scepter is extended, okay, maybe her life would be spared for breaking the law of the land. But then she thinks about it, and she realizes the king's paid no attention to me for 30 days. Can you imagine that in a marriage? Your spouse, no real attention for you for 30 days? And so she's wondering, is this the time to approach the king? He seems very disinterested in me. It's like I don't even matter for the last 30 days. Is this the time to risk my life? And she's trying to sort through that, and there's probably a lot of feelings that are telling her this is dangerous, this might not work, I'm scared, maybe that started to rise up. I want to tell you, when you follow Jesus, it's good to notice your feelings, but your feelings can't have the final say. If the feelings of fear dictate the situation, she's not going to approach the king. But instead, she's going to walk by faith and not just feelings. Feelings can be a gift. They can be good. But ultimately, faith, facts, trusting the Lord, trusting God's hand, more than just some difficult feelings that we need to sort through. And, and what you see happening here is that God's hand is moving and the work of God is spreading. First, Mordecai. Now Esther, more involved, she's catching the passion. This is what God will do. He will put someone on fire for the Lord. And the people around, it's good to be taught, but sometimes it's also caught. And when you're on fire, the people around you, they're going to start to catch some of that passion for the Lord, and now the culture is going to change. And that's what you see. Mordecai, now Esther, Let's see how it continues to grow. Here's the third way we see God's hand in this chapter. You experience both joy and a sense of being compelled. When God's in it, there's incredible joy. There's a sense of being compelled. Take a look at verse 12. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back the answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Faith includes joy, a sense of being compelled. I want to share a quote from a college football coach named Dabo Sweeney, and he's a coach of Clemson. I wouldn't expect this part of the country, there'd be a lot of Clemson fans, but you do need to know that Dabo is a brother in the Lord and very solid in his faith, uh, shares Jesus. God is using him in tremendous ways. This is his quote. He says, I know I'm going to meet him. I'm going to come before God one day. And he's not going to pat me on the back and talk about how many wins I had or how many Coach of the Year trophies we got or how much money I made. I really think he's going to hold me accountable to how I took advantage of the opportunity and the blessings he gave me. The impact that I had on young people, the type of men that we develop through a game. I like that quote. 
There's a lot of joy for Dabo. He's won a couple national titles recently, but he sees the picture clearly. He sees the kingdom. He sees what's most important. And football, it's just a platform. It's just a platform. What matters most is relationships. What matters most is the next generation. That's what matters. Football's the platform. Wherever you work, your workplace, it's just a platform. It's good. It's a blessing. God provides it. Use your gifts, but it's a platform for changed lives. And in your neighborhood where you live, your house, that's just a platform right there. What God gives you is the platform, and he sees this, and he's very intentional, and he knows when he comes before the Lord, there's a sense of responsibility for what God has given him and how he should live out and pass on the faith to the next generation. He's leading many people to Jesus right now in our country. Well, in the book of Esther, there's both God's sovereignty and individual responsibility. It's a both and. It's a both and throughout the Bible. And for some people, there's extra responsibility. I read the Bible, and in the book of James chapter 3, it says there's extra responsibility for teachers of the word and for pastors. I see extra responsibility for parents and grandparents. I see extra responsibility in the Bible for people who have a lot of talents and gifts. I see extra responsibility for people who have a lot of money, for people who have a lot of time. The principle is to whom much is given, much will be required. And it's a both and, God's sovereignty and our responsibility. And God's sovereignty takes the pressure off us, takes the pressure off Esther. Did you see what Mordecai explained to her? That if you don't step up, God's going to deliver everyone. He's been reading the Bible. He knows the book. He knows God. He knows God's promises. God's going to do this. God says this, the gates of hell won't prevail against the church, his people. Now, step up and let's do it together. But hey, uh, even in rebellion, God is still, Jesus is still going to reign forever and ever. And so what a privilege to step up and use our gifts, our talents for the Lord. You are God's plan A. You are God's plan A for Auburn, for the sound. He's looking to you and to work through you in amazing ways. Uh, Mordecai is going to bring out the best in Esther. Wouldn't that be great if all across our church family, we just bring out the best in each other? Just help each other rise up above the challenges. Bring out the best. Affirm each other. The gifts, the talents. And you've got to be persistent. Mordecai's persistent with Esther on this point. And she's taking all this in. And then what a phrase. What a wonderful phrase. For such a time as this, Esther. Do you sense that in your own life? For such a time as 2019. For such a time as this, God's plan, how he's placed you, how he's prepared you for this time in your life right now, for such a time as this. Esther, what does that look like? Here's an example. A week ago in our church, there was a day of, uh, well, dresses for Africa. And a lot of people here have sewing gifts. I don't. A lot of people do. Uh, and using their gifts for the Lord. Take a look at the dresses, and you'll see different people serving here, different ages, serving, making the dresses. In this next picture, you'll see grandma and granddaughter making the dresses together. Well, a team from our church went to Tanzania last year and was able to deliver the clothes, the dresses. And I lived in Zimbabwe. I lived in Africa. It was startling to me, the lack of clean water, the lack of hygiene, the lack of food, the lack of money, the lack of clothes. There's a lot of needs. And being able to bring these gifts and, uh, and these dresses will continue to go out in Africa as the kids, beautiful kids, just awesome kids in Africa as they uh, receive these dresses and these gifts as well. God is working through you and our church family. I would say this, faith looks the best when it's in action. Would you agree? It's good to have faith, but faith really looks the best when it's in action, like this in these pictures that we see here. I was talking to an atheist recently, and we were both looking at what Christians were doing to make a difference in the community, and it caught his attention, and I made that statement, faith looks its best when it's in action, and he said, amen. <laughs> I got an amen from an atheist in the last week. It's tough to get an amen at church some weekends, <laughs> But I'm getting amen from an atheist. That's what's happening. Uh, God's moving. 
You know, maybe you're at a crossroads and you're thinking, should I step up? I know what God's hand is doing in my life. Should I do it? I've got to make a decision. This is what I want to say is the fourth specific. God creates in you a glorious willingness to risk. A glorious willingness to risk. Do you know how hard it is to get some people just to be willing just to be willing to lead a life group, just to be willing to love your neighbors and get to know your neighbors, just to be willing to share your faith, just to be willing to use your gifts, just to be willing to listen well to other people. That is a huge, huge step, just to be willing and to offer yourselves in worship to the Lord and say, all right, Lord, here I am. Uh, Check out the willingness in verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Some risk assessment. We don't want to take risks if the Lord's not in it. But risk assessment, what is the cost? There is a cost. What are the priorities in my life? And then do I need to reshuffle my priorities? And what's my determination? What is this cause that I will invest my life in? What are the needs around me? What are the prayerful decisions? What is God asking me to do? And for Esther, I will do the right thing even if I die on this mountain. I will do the right thing. Do you have some mountains that you would die on that you would lay down your life to love people, to do what God wants. I think a Dr. King made a decision. I will do the right thing even if I die on this mountain. And a lot of people will die doing the right thing. Esther, the first step here is to fast and to pray. Now, prayer's not written in there. You're astute. You notice also in this book, the name of God is not in there. It's a literary highlight feature so that we would especially notice it. It's not in there. God, his hand, prayer, and today, would you just reject despair, reject hopelessness, reject being passive. That's what Esther's decision is. Reject despair, hopelessness, passivity. I'm going to reject that in for three days fast and pray. We see three days in the Bible Three days, Jesus crucified on Friday, still in the grave on Saturday. Everyone's watching, doesn't look like much is happening, but Sunday morning, the third day, look what happens, risen from the dead. First day, you're gonna fast and pray. Might not look like much. Second day, keep going. But that third day, after you prayed and fasted for three days, and notice, fasting for someone else. When's the last time you fasted for someone else? It's good to fast for yourself in what God's doing in your own life. That's great. But what about fasting for someone else? Or what about at the crossroads asking a lot of people to pray for you? What you're going through right now, pride says, I'll do it alone. I'm not going to bother anyone. I don't need prayers. I got this. Well, actually, wisdom says, ask other people to pray. Got a friend who is going to Pakistan, dangerous place. He got 100 people to pray daily for him before he went to Pakistan. I thought that is so wise. Mobilizing people. It says that Esther and her maids will fast and pray. She was probably teaching her maids how to pray, the importance of fasting. Let's do this together. When God's going to move, he often first gets his people to pray. When God's people pray, just stay alert. Because God does amazing things when his people pray. Uh, And as he does that, and as he does it in our lives, let's just stop here for a reality check. Okay, reality check. God's moving us. Here it is. God's best stuff that he does is often difficult, dangerous, or costly. The very best stuff that God wants to do through you, difficult, dangerous sometimes, and costly as well. The bigger the turnaround, like if you want to turn things around in your family after three generations of alcoholism, that's a big turnaround. Sexual abuse, that's a big turnaround. 
You see around Auburn and you want to turn around. You know the healing and the turnaround we need in our nation. The bigger the turnaround, often the bigger the cost. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? You, you don't just turn a church around by just changing a couple bulletins. You know, you go deep to turn the thing around and it costs, it costs time and money and prayer and energy. It costs the bigger the turnaround. Think about Jesus, the mission on the cross. Was it difficult? Can you imagine? Was it dangerous? Brutally killed. Cost, cost the father his son. Was it worth it? Absolutely. Redemption to the world. So we've got to think through. It might mean we drop some idols. For me, I like what's comfortable. That's where I naturally gravitate. Maybe drop some idols to say yes to God's hand. God's hand is in the unselfish, in the courageous, in the inspiring. And the message that God brings to Mordecai, you can do something about this. God's message through Mordecai to Esther, you can do something about this. And I want to tell you, whatever's the most discouraging thing you see right now, I want to say very clearly, you can do something about this. God working through you. It's just like Costa Rica. A team here in our church family, God's hand moves, we can go, we can serve, we can love people, we can make a difference in Costa Rica, and we send them out together. Psalm 138, verse 8, David writes this, David says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hand. David had wealth, David had power, David had a position, David had pos possessions, David had comfort. It's not enough. It's not enough. God's plan. There might be some good blessings in that, but God's plan for me, that's what he's looking at. Uh, consider today the sacrifice, the cost, the danger, but also, even more so, pay attention to what is God doing in your life underneath the surface. Maybe your closest friends and family don't even know how God is moving you deeply. What is he doing underneath the surface for such a time as this? As we uh, just move into our weeks this week, may that phrase stick in our spirit for such a time as this. Grace Community Church, I've just never been more excited about the potential right now at our church and in Auburn and in the Sound for such a time as this. For you personally, maybe you feel like your back's against the wall, but God's saying this is your time for such a time as this, for the glory of God. Say yes to God's hand. Let's pray. Father, thank you how you move. Thank you that it's full of grace. Lord, we are uh, often hurting and broken and feel lonely, but your hand of healing and touch, God, lifts us up, that we rise up together. God, that we don't sit back passively and in despair, but we move forward in your power by your hand, trusting your sovereignty, and Lord, also saying yes to our roles. Guide us individually and together, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The prayer team's going to be over to my right. Encourage you to join for prayer. As the ushers come forward, we take up our offering. On that connecting card, for such a time as this, if this is your day to say yes to Jesus and follow him, check that box for the first time. Join a life group. Get baptized if you haven't. Check that box. And let's sing praises. This song right here is that God would do it again. We read what God does in the book of Esther. Let's make the song our prayer that God would do it again for such a time as this.